Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, for anyone just joining us this afternoon, just a reminder to please use the Q&A box for any questions that you may have, and I'll be addressing them at the end of Gail's presentation. Uh, as a reminder, if you're just joining us as well, uh, join us again tomorrow at lunchtime for our networking session where you can connect with some others in your field. We've got a bunch of different tables that you can join based on your topic of interest, and you can head over to the Expo tab at the top right of your screen to check those out. Uh, there are lots of resources that you can access throughout the event, um, and then during the designated networking session tomorrow, you'll be able to join an informal roundtable discussion to learn from others and share some of your experience. So without further ado, I'm not going to take any more of Gail's time here. I'm really excited to introduce our first keynote speaker of the forum, uh, Gail Kranzberg. Gail is a professor of the Masters of Engineering and Public Policy program at McMaster University. And today she's joining us to talk about how climate change is driving species expansion. Gail, I'll let you take it away from here. Thanks for joining us Thank today. You. Thank you so much. There we are. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I want to thank the forum organizers for giving me this opportunity to chat with you about how climate change and invasive species are linked and how we could, it's a call for action, action on climate change, action on invasive species. We already know a lot about the effects of the invasive species, but what I'm going to cover today is a little bit of the overview of climate change, what it's doing in the Great Lakes region. Um, what the implications are then for alien invasive species, then because there's so much uncertainty about the species and changing climate, we need a new era of science, a predictive science that will help us understand threats to the region and enhance the resilience of the, of, of the Great Lakes. I'm going to talk about some work of the International Joint Commission in that regard. And then finally, how do we move forward collaboratively? How do we make decisions collaboratively on stopping the invasions? So let's talk about the Great Lakes context. We know that in the Great Lakes, we're going to have an increased severity of storms, which leads to sheet runoff. All the automotive particles off of your cars will be washed into the lakes. Or we have combined sewers that are overflowing. And those combined sewers, if you're not familiar, carry human sewage and stormwater, and they overflow and put raw sewage into the lakes, enhancing or increasing pollution. So more frequent extreme weather, floods and droughts put a stress on our native species and open the door for invasive species movement into existing niches. So prolonged periods of drought. This is a picture of Wasega Beach on Georgian Bay and you see nice smooth sand and all this cobbly stuff, which is actually where the water land interface used to be. And on times of low water levels, well, you can see that the implications are dropping lake levels. Not all the time. Sometimes we have extremely high lake levels, but we have extremes. That's the point. It's extremes. And when we get extreme drops, we lose habitat and wetland habitat and create more stress on native biodiversity, opening the door for invaders. So these changes in climate mean a change in net area in our wetlands, loss of the nearshore zone, and the potential increase of alien species coming in because of thermal shifts where the water was too cold, now it's possible for them to survive, where the winters were too brutal, now it's possible them, for them to survive. So we see shifts in species uh, and the, an increase, not always, but often an increase in alien invasive species, and they're very damaging. So just to give you a, a sense, this is just from 20 years ago, that damages from non-indigenous plants, fish, mollusks, let alone insects and terrestrial plants were over $2.5 billion a year. And that doesn't even account for the true cost of species extinction. How do you put a value on the loss of biodiversity or aesthetic damages? So we're talking about many billions of dollar, dollars annually due to non-invasive species, non-native species, pardon me. The poster child, right? Everybody knows about zebra mussels. 
You're not going to be taking much water into this intake pipe because it's completely clogged with zebra mussels, which means municipalities are spending millions and tens of millions every year making sure their pipes don't get clogged with the little villagers, a little floaty life stage of zebra mussels and, and destroy the water infrastructure. But they do damage to native species like this crayfish or these mollusks that a filter water and zebra mussels like to go where water is moving. And so they smother our native species. We also see damage like this, which looks like aesthetic damage. These are the shells washed up on shore on a beach in Lake Erie. And if you wanted to go swimming there, you better wear shoes because it's like glass shards and it'll rip your feet apart. So this is a cost to aesthetics, but it's a cost to the economy, the recreation economy, the tourism economy. And we thought, okay, zebra mussels are here and may not be here because of climate change. They're here because they came on ballast tanks and ship going vessels from uh, the Black Sea, but they don't like it really cold. So at least Lake Superior in the depths of Michigan and Huron might be saved. But then along comes their cousins, the quagga mussels. And quagga mussels like it very much when it's very cold. So now we have zebras and quaggas everywhere causing these massive damages to the system. So I wanna thank the, uh, uh, the invasive species um, uh, consor consortium because this is one of your, your figures. The changing climate affects species life cycle. So it, cha it changes abilities to move into new areas. So climate change and invasive species invasions are tightly linked. There's one that you may not be so familiar with, the spotted lanternfly, that's indigenous to China, spread now into Japan, South Korea. It's in the United States. In fact, it's in Niagara Falls, New York, right across the river from Niagara Falls, Ontario. And these lanternflies really likes, really like to eat things like soybeans, fruits, and grapes. And the risk to our grape growing in Ontario when, and not if, but when the lanternfly comes, tells us we better know something about the biology and how to control it, or that industry is going to crash. Here's another really strange animal, the jumping worm, um, native to East Central Asia. And they like to eat topsoil, which causes erosion, kills plants, if you have this in your home garden, you may find lots of your plants are starting to die. They cause massive environmental harm where they're established, and they are in Ontario. Other, so some just a picture of like what is here anyway. Well, started off really a lot of the invaders in early years at the turn of the 20th century were plants. They were brought in for horticultural ornamentals. Purple loosestrife is a perfect example. It's a pretty Eurasian plant, but it also can destroy wetlands. And as time moved on, we're seeing more crustaceans, some fishes, um, and some microbial invaders as well. So the non-indigenous aquatic species are very diverse. And so you can imagine the impacts on the system are equally diverse. Again, the ISC has this great illustration about what happens over time. So species is limited by climate, the severity of the winters, the coldness of the waters or the, or, or the habitat of the forest. When the climate becomes favorable, the species comes, finds it, it is able to reproduce here and then rapidly grows exponentially, which means if we don't catch them before they come and keep our eyes out for them, the cost of control is enormous. And there's a lot of science that we need to understand where these species are around the globe and how they might be able to get to the Great Lakes, which ones might be able to get to the Great Lakes. And so we need to be united in our science because early warning systems can reduce the risk of invaders. So we, I want to turn our attention then to, told you a bit of the story about how climate change and invasive species are linked. Now let's look about some science that we need. The International Joint Commission, which is a treaty organization um, with six commissioners appointed by the president and the prime minister's office, 
to protect the boundary waters between Canada and the United States. And on the Great Lakes, they advise the governments on things that they ought to be doing to protect and restore and sustain the excellence of the Great Lakes. But there's a need for a science strategy. And a number of the advisory boards to the International Joint Commission have been working on this for the last two, three years. We need more scientific information to make smarter decisions for management and for restoration. But the science plan that I'm talking about here goes well beyond restoration. Restoration in the United States, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, has provided billions of dollars towards restore, restoring a system, to remediating a system. But no such money has been invested for over 20 years in revitalizing modernizing Great Lakes science. So there's new pressures that are affecting the ecosystem. They're affecting the ecosystem, they're affecting the economy of the region, the social cohesion of the regions, and communities, cities, conservation authorities, others are looking for solutions to adapt and respond to new pressures. And some of these pressures we're not even sure are here yet, but we imagine they could be. So the science plan then, could collect, if implemented, could collect the kind of information we need to forecast change, to forecast which species and which part of the world will find it favorable to come into the Great Lakes. How might they get there? How might we stop them from coming here? You clearly, this is a call to help us forecast our future better. You, you can't forecast the, the future unless you have some understanding of how it works. So this is about explorational studies, collecting data, creating models, leading to policy on how to protect the region, how to make it more sustainable. So the Binational Decadal Science Plan for the Great Lakes, which was compiled by the International Joint Commission Science Advisory Board. I'm the Canadian co-chair of the Decadal Science Plan with Val Klump, my American counterpart. We're gonna be talking about this in Toronto in more detail. Um, at the International Association for Great Lakes Researchers Conference in Toronto in, in May, early May. And here's a sample of what the science needs look like. We really need to better understand how climate change is affecting the Great Lakes and will for the next 20 to 50 years. We need big science and big data in order to do that. What happens in the lakes during the winter? Is the winter the time of year where invasives could be killed off, but they aren't because the winters are milder? What happens under the ice in the lakes? That's a long period. We've got a long winter in the Great Lakes region, and we don't know what goes on in the lakes in the wintertime. What happens when there's no ice over the lakes in the wintertime? So there's a winter science component of the science need. And how do invasive species change the chemical cycling in the Great Lakes? We know that zebra mussel change nutrient cycling. Um, we have near shore zones that are very low in nutrients because the zebra mussels have been um, processing those nutrients rapidly through their bodies and the nutrients are going offshore. But what is happening to the food web we heard just recently, if you weren't there for the, the video, what Asian carp could be doing to the food web dynamics in the Great Lakes if they get if if they get in. I hope this is not a when. I hope this is an if. But they could destroy the Great Lakes fishery and dominate the fishery. When they come up the Illinois River, in the Mississippi River, up into the Illinois River, they represent 99% of the biomass of fish in that river which means our recreational fishing, which is worth at least seven to $8 billion annually, can be gone. Our recreational fishing, that's a massive input, input of the economy of the region, could be, could be destroyed. What more modern scientific techniques and tools can be used more effectively? We still have bodies on boats going out into the lake. Are, are there better ways? And the Great Lakes Observing System, uh, also a binational organization, is looking very closely into new buoys and, and monitoring techniques. And also, 
there are under, underserved groups in the Great Lakes regions, people who are living, um, the environmental justice movement in, in the US is particularly big on this and, and we, we need to catch up in Canada. People who can only afford to live in the most polluted places because those are the cheapest. How do we stop that from happening? How do we deal with equity, diversity and inclusion in Canada? How do we, in, how do we think about our undeserved groups, under, underserved groups like our important indigenous um, tribes and, and First Nations that don't even have safe drinking water? What is going on? There's a scientific need and a scientific gap there to, to help serve those who are not being having access to the benefits of, of the wonders of the Great Lakes because of where they are, where they live, or their economies. So here's some of the investment priorities for Great Lakes science that will help us with climate change, invasive species, chemicals, and so many other things understand what we don't know. And to do this, by the way, you might say, how do we get to this point? This two and a half year project of the International Joint Commission was done by including surveys and, um, well, virtual workshops because of COVID with over 100 to 200 scientists, academics, plus hundreds of uh, practitioners from government and non-government organizations. So this is not a group of people in, in the International Joint Commission who thought these were the priorities. This is a very broad cross section of user groups and researchers saying, we don't understand what's going on in the winter and we need to. We also need monitoring infrastructure, long-term monitoring stations, long-term data management tools, high resolution models to forecast system changes. So it's one thing to have this beautiful ship, the Guardian, that's the United States Environmental Protection Agency vessel, but we also need um, buoys and robots and drones and other technologies to have a robust monitoring scheme so we can detect new species earlier. We can detect changes in climate at a finer scale. And we're also calling for the establishment of centers of excellence to advance interdisciplinary science, uh, to support management, for policy, to, to address economic decision-making. These centers of excellence could be a center of excellence for uh, alien invasive species from all cross sections. If you're a forest person, an insect person, a plant person, a bacteria person, all join into the center of excellence. If you're from the States, from Canada, Ontario, it doesn't matter. Create these centers of excellence. We could have a center of excellence for traditional ecological knowledge and build on our ind indigenous, thousands of years of indigenous observations on the Great Lakes to tell us what's changing, fine tune what's changing, tell us how to integrate traditional ecological knowledge with Western science, if it can be done. There's lots of opportunities for these centers of excellence to happen and to, to engage new researchers, get youth to populate the, the Great Lakes research agenda and be the next generation of change agents. They could be virtual centers or they could be brick and mortar centers, but we need these centers of excellence. And the International Joint Commission particularly has endorsed a binational Great Lakes monitoring program. I would prefer that language to say transnational because the Great Lakes are more than Canada and the United States. They are hundreds of indigenous tribes and First Nations groups but we need to have the information to forecast change, to mitigate impacts and to preserve and enhance, in fact, the Great Lakes ecosystem. So when we invest significantly in monitoring, we understand what has happened in the past, but we might better understand the future. That's the need for the research. So we need to transfer scientific knowledge into societal benefits. This, this project to enhance science in the region was not done by a bunch of academics because they wanted more money to hire more grad students. It's because the societal benefits of understanding the integrity of the system are massive. We, you know, transportation, recreation, biodiversity, fisheries, jobs, wealth, um, 
nature observation, all of these are societal benefits that will not stand this test of time unless we have new technological breakthrough, breakthroughs that give us better understanding of the science so that we can protect those societal benefits. We need to understand what we don't understand. What do we not know? We don't really know well, we know somewhat, but we don't really know well how much climate change will impact the spread of invasive species, alien invasive species. So if we can close that gap, we can start developing solutions that have a social benefit and economic benefit as well. This is not just science for science, this is science for society. We also need to better understand what is our research infrastructure? How many winter vessels do we need? How do we improve our observational capability, networking capabilities to predict and to, to detect the appearance of new invaders as climate changes or as transportation, global transportation changes, as shipping changes, as trade brings plants from one part of the world to another part of the world? We need that research infrastructure in the Great Lakes. We have never done this for the Great Lakes this is probably one of the most important things the International Joint Commission has done for our region in many decades. So even say the science does improve and we are successful in getting a hundred million dollars a year in US dollars for 10 years, that's what we estimate this will be. And we improve that science, how do we coordinate our efforts to address climate change and its impact on the invasion of foreign species? How do we collaborate? How do we work together? We are so siloed. I, I mean, I, look, I work at a university and there are people studying things in little bits and pieces and they don't even talk to their neighbors. We need to work collaboratively. So how do we actually do that? Is there a process? Instead of saying it would be nice if we all collaborated, that sounds very kind, sounds like a political statement. But in fact, there are tools to allow us to move towards solving problems together. And one of the tools I wanna to leave us with today is scenario analysis. One does not, <clears throat> it is not possible to do scenario analysis by yourself. I'll explain why in a moment. It is required by the process itself, that this be done by many people sharing information all along the way of developing the scenarios. It's all about imagining plausible futures, not just imagining, it's not just science fiction, but what could happen if. So scenario analysis says, what would happen if? And here's how it works. The plausible futures, we think what would happen if, helps us improve our understanding of uncertainty. It helps us uncover certain assumptions that we think this is the status quo. Well, what if we change that assumption and change that? What if we were more risk adverse, more, or, or, more, or more welcoming of risk? It provides a platform for strategically evaluating our decisions. If we made a decision to scenario A today, where might it lead us to in the future? If we made a decision on scenario C, where might it lead us in the future? And if you look at these trajectories, scenario A, B, and C, you might think about the IPCC and climate change scenarios. Scenario A is amount, increasing amounts of carbon. Scenario C is decreasing amounts of carbon. What does the plausible future look like? So here's the structured process. Scenario analysis identifies driving forces. So what drives invasive species? Climate, suitable habitat, nutrients, transportation, commerce, fishing, you name it. Think of all the various ec economic, social, environmental driving forces that change, could change the future. What drives climate change? finance, technology for low carbon economies, um, vehicles, emissions, uh, walkability of cities, um, 
mining of the oil sands, you identify the driving forces. And then you do this as a group of people, all with different disciplines, all with different types of expertise from industry, business, academics, governments, citizens, everybody has a different background, teachers, everybody has a different background. They will think of different driving forces. And then as a, as a group, you say, okay, what do we think are two axes, X and Y, that are very uncertain, but very, very important in driving the future? Like, like for invasive speed, like it might be trade, it might be climate. Those are two very different uncertainties. But when you plot them, you get these four boxes. And each box tells a story. So you talk about a very positive change in one driver, a positive change in another driver, and that's your happy future. And you describe that happy future. And then you say, well, what decisions did we have to go through to make us reach that happy future? And those are the logical paths. Those are the decision-making paths. Those will tell you that the paths we're on now, the decisions we're making right now, unfortunately, are leading us to the very worst possible future. Maybe. So they, these are your scenarios. Highly influential axes, highly uncertain. And plus plus is, like I say, your happy place, your happy future. Scenario A is your happy future, positive developments in, in both axes. And the very worst place that you want to be in is where you have very negative developments on the drivers in both the X and Y axes. So it could be this, for example. We could say one of the one of the drivers of change for controlling invasive species could be governance. If we have good interconnected governance, we're all talking together, we're collaborating, we're 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 sharing policies, we're sharing the decision making process. Good governance means people are engaged, it's transparent, people are accountable for the decisions made, there's checks and bounds versus fragmented governance where Michigan does their thing, Illinois does their thing, Ontario does their thing, Canada does their thing, EPA does their thing, Canada, Environment Canada does their thing, the universities do their thing, everybody does a little piece. But nobody's really talking to each other and it doesn't work. Or we could say we the y-axis is about a community focus. And when it comes to protecting fisheries, for example, I've come to understand that the fishery community people are a community that are focused on protecting that fishery, no matter what kind of fish it is, no matter whether it's stocking, whether it's, it's reducing um, take loads, whatever, harvesting. It's a community that's all focused on the same thing, preventing the newest invader from coming here and sharing, again, sharing that community focus, volunteerism, for example. Or it's just individualism. I'm putting my boat in. I'm taking it out. I don't care. It's my boat. It's my right. I can do whatever I want. I have my bait bucket. I found these little minnows in this lake. They're cute. I'm going to take my, my bait bucket to another place. And um, when I'm done, I'm going to dump my bait bucket. This is my bait bucket. I don't care. It's on. Individualism doesn't work. So think about you've got fragmented governance, individualism. What do you think is going to happen in this future? Invasive species are going to run wild. Run wild Governments are not going to be able to coordinate policies or programs because they're fragmented. Individuals will ignore any policies that might be put in place because it shouldn't apply to them. The world goes to heck. Whereas if you're up here, people are engaged. They're listening to what the policymakers are doing because they've been part of the policymaking process. They're taking responsibility. They're slowing the spread. They're stopping invaders. We're getting to a future that is very bright and very promising. So the next step then is to say, I've just described that future. What programs and policies would lead us to that future? What would lead us to interconnected governance, to good governance? What decisions do we need to make today to get good governance in the future? How do we avoid the individualistic thing? How do we educate the public on the importance of community collaboration? So why do this at all? It's to understand the implications of our decisions today 
to the future of the Great Lakes region or Ontario or Canada, be it, what, be it as it may, so that we can understand that our decisions today can improve and slow the spread of invasives, improve the climate, reduce greenhouse gases, adapt to a changing climate more proactively. So there is no planet B. Well, there, the, look, I'll, I'll be very frank here. If we fail in all of this, the planet will survive. Biodiversity will be completely different. It will not support humanity the way we know it, but the planet will survive. There's no planet B for humanity. So the importance of addressing climate change and basic species to the economy, social cohesion and ecology of the region is imperative. Now remember that if we do successfully adapt to a changing climate, it doesn't mean there won't be any negative impacts. It doesn't mean we'll stop every invader from coming, only that the impacts will probably be less severe than if we had not done any adaptation measures. So successful adaptation to severe storm events would be improve the way the water permeates through the ground. Don't pave over, you know, don't pave over paradise. Don't pave over a green belt. Let it be there as the sponge so you don't get as much flooding. So successful adaptation doesn't mean there won't be a flood, but it means it will be less severe. And when we decide adaptation options to a changing climate, um, we need to understand what's effective, what's feasible, and the likelihood that if we have adaptation mechanisms, that they will be adopted by all those around us, by all orders of government, by businesses, industries, landscape architects, planners, everybody. So I'm a big fan of adaptation. Yes, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the the co-benefit for invasive species is clear. But the climate has changed and we need to adjust to that. And we need to adjust to that right away because it's the climate's not going to go back to what it was. I'm just going to leave you with a few images of some of these species that, um, well, that probably have reacted to climate change. You may know emerald ash borer came into Essex County, Southwest Ontario about early 2000. And as a response, Monroe County clear cut massive swaths of forest to stop the emerald ash borer from going from tree to tree to tree to tree and going all throughout the region. So by creating this big gap in the forest, it was an attempt to stop the spread of emerald ash borers, except although there were signs everywhere that said, do not move the wood, people saw free firewood. And the Emerald Ash Borer Hotels went all over the place. And right now, ash is a very rare commodity, if you can find it at all. Um, and that's a massive economic blow, let alone the blow to the forests themselves. Phragmites. I hope, I, I hope if you were in the room, you'd be groaning when you see Phragmites, because you know what a tenacious beast it is. Beautiful, but its root systems release toxins that kill the surrounding plants and it takes over everything. It will fill up a wetland completely and desiccate it. Well, yes, Asian carp. Asian carp, I'm not so certain, are bounded by climate. We have a, an appropriate climate for Asian carp right now, um, but clearly human activity without clearly thinking about what you're doing caused the Asian carp invasion, right? I mean. Catfish farmers in Arkansas were having a viral problem in their with the snails in their in their aquaculture cages. So they imported Asian carp to eat those snails because Asian carp will never escape. The Asian carp will never escape. The Titanic will never sink. The rabbits will not be a problem in Australia. And we had a flood. And Asian carp are now knocking at the door in Illinois into uh, Lake Michigan and Chicago. Then we have. Other insects that are creeping up northward, northern uh, di dimensions because of the change in climate. The southern pine beetles now moving into the north of the United States, devastating pine forests. It could easily come into Ontario. The black tick legged tick, also rarely found in Ontario, 
um, um, are now much more common um, due to a change in climate, doing, being able to um, withstand our freezing winters that aren't as freezing anymore. Well, this winter happens to be a good example of that. Next time we get a really cold, rem remember it's a change in climate, it's not consistent climate, but they carry, they cause Lyme disease. So they're a huge health threat. So we have economic threats, health threats. And here's kudzu. Kudzu is a climbing vine. It's native to Eastern Asia. It was imported into the States because it has a beautiful flower. It's incredibly fast growing. It will cover, this is a, this is a house in the States that's been obviously not lived in, <laughs> but totally in, enclosed in kudzu um, because it, it, it it destroys biodiversity, becomes a monoculture. It will kill shrubs and smother them. And unfortunately, I just discovered this very recently that it's in our Southwest. It's actually been found in Leamington, Ontario now. This is a massive threat, massive threat to biodiversity in our region. So while some of these messages has not been happy, um, I, I leave you with this magnificent picture of, uh, of the Great Lakes and or encourage us to persevere with the work that we do because it's definitely worth protecting. It's worth to understand collaboration, to understand the science, to cooperate, to form partnerships, to understand the link between various stressors and invasive species. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions and thank you for making the lakes great. Thank you so much, Gail, for that great talk. You gave us all a lot to think about this afternoon. Uh, we have a few questions coming in for you, so I'll jump right into those. Uh, for the exponential graph, which I think was at the beginning of your talk, uh, where climate becomes favorable for invasives, uh, isn't there an opposite relationship occurring for native species, where native species are now struggling to survive in the new climate, do we preserve native species if the climate is one they can't survive? Yes, that's a great question. In fact, a good example of that is if you look at the range limit of the boreal forest, it's gone north because it's too warm for boreal species to live in that same latitude. And so they're going north. So it's a perfect example of how a warming climate Cold water fish in the Great Lakes, for example, they like it cold and some of the some of the tributaries and, and near shore zones in Erie and Ontario are too warm and they're being forced to move north. So that does happen and we're bringing invasives in and we're pushing some of our native species further north. Absolutely. Do you think for particularly insect species, their host um, movement could affect where the invasive insects end up too? So the problem with like, okay. the insect species, insect species reproduce rapidly, right? So their ability to adapt, mutate and adapt to a changing climate is massively faster than for example, a mammal, right? So you can see insect species that would adapt more readily to a changing climate than, um, a, long, long, than a tree or a fish, a long lived fish, for example. So the insects could be, they're so adaptable. The smaller you go, and, and, and viruses and bacteria, very, very adaptable. So they could adapt to a changing climate much more rapidly than the other species around them. Awesome. Thank you, Gail. Um, okay, looking forward to the IJC science strategy draft. In the collaborative model that you proposed, where would you start? Start, uh, well, the way, the way we are starting is to say this was a project, it was a project that the IJC started, but it's not finished. The implementation strategy is the hardest part. And it's about bringing together a number of institutions to build the science plan. What are we gonna do first? What is the funding gonna go for? How are we gonna govern this? So we're now consulting with the Great Lakes Commission, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, some very large NGOs around the Great Lakes area, like the Alliance for the Great Lakes Region, for example, the Alliance Council of the Great Lakes Region. Um, and eventually there will be a whole series of focus groups, roundtables, 
Um, um, we're, talk, we're talking with senators, we're talking with parliamentarians, we're looking at foundations to try and shop around the benefits of investing in this for the multi-trillion dollar economy of this region, which cannot be sustained unless the region is healthy and which can't be healthy unless we understand them. So this is a process that is just being launched now. IAGLER is the International Association of Great Lakes Research. Their conference in May is the first time, is the second time actually, we're going to be showcasing the science plan and seeking people to join us in making it happen because this has to be done. And, and this is different from investing in remediation, investing in, in you know, fixing up the past mistakes. Environment and Climate Change Canada does that. Ontario Minister of the Environment, Parks and Conservation does that. The United States EPA does that. This is new. This is science for the future. This is for the future workplace. This is for future employment. This is for the future of the integrity of the region. So it's not one institution or organization that pulled this off. It needs to be a collaborative building of the momentum to get our parliamentarians, to get our senators to understand the value and then seek the money to invest in it. So I'm hoping that this time within one, two, three years, we may be able to start celebrating. There may be some institutions that say, I have the perfect idea for a center of excellence. Our institution wants to set up this particular center of excellence. Go for it. You don't have to have all the pieces in place. You know, as soon as something's ready to move, there's some news winter vessels that are being purchased in the United States and the Great Lakes site. Great, we can advance winter science. So it doesn't have to be one package that we launch. Each piece as it's ready to go is, is a piece that we didn't have before. That's great, Gail. Thanks so much. And hopefully that gives some encouragement for the future as well. It's kind of a daunting field to work in. So it's nice to have some, some encouraging. Okay, a couple more questions for you. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you, Gail. As the climate continues to change, many rare and at-risk species may continue to be pushed out of their native habitats. And we may expect northern range expansions, as you mentioned. Uh, assisted range expansion is being discussed in some areas. I'm curious about your thoughts on this and whether there's a conflict between these two concepts, uh, AIS management versus encouraging range expansion. Or do you think both management strategies can coexist under future climate scenarios? I'm not sure I caught every one of those words. <laughs> um, so, well, I mean, so the two that you're talking about, the two concepts, can you remind um, yeah, assisted range expansion and then the natural northern range expansion of species through climate change. So I, I think nature needs help. Um, so um, so when, I, when I think about a change in climate, for example, uh, I, may, I may not answer your question exactly, but I may do it by analogy. When we invest in reestablishing all the wetlands that have been lost in the Great Lakes and we don't do it with a climate lens, we may be building things that will be land rather than wetlands if lakes continue to drop. So anything that we can do to help expand the range of a species that's being pushed out of its current range is a good thing. It probably means protecting, conserving green space that enables it, that it enables species that are moving away to find a home to go to. So there's a lot of, so, and, and our federal government is investing now in conservation spaces, um, some 35% more conservation spaces, I think by year X, don't have the date. But the more we can invest in, in conservation easements, conservation regions, that will help with species that are trying to migrate to other places. And that's, that's the way I would answer the question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Gail. I'll also add that we do have a presentation coming up tomorrow with Jeff Farah from Natural Resources Canada, and he's going to be talking about adaptive silviculture, um, which I think fits into that um, assisted migration. So whoever asks that question, maybe tune into that. Uh, okay, so is there anything that you know that's being done now about Kudzu in southwestern Ontario? Anything that is being what? Sorry? Is it now about kudzu in southwestern oh, Ontario? No, this is, 
I'm sorry. I, I, I wish I'd been spending more time on that. This was a, a huge revolution to me. Now, bear in mind, Kudzu is, in, is a southern U.S. invader, and their rate of growth in the south would be massively faster than here. Um, but I think what what I would imagine that they, since it's been reported there that the conservation authorities out there should have their eyes peeled and 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 figure out ways of stopping it uh, before it 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 flowers, blooms and 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 reproduces in massive amounts. I think if it's just been discovered, there's a there's a potential to stop it. Most invasive species, when they discover it's too late. But because I believe and I'm not an expert on this, but I believe because their growth rate would not be as severe as rapid that it could be controlled but i would defer the question to the to to the um the regional conservation authority to see what they're doing about a mystery of natural resources and forestry to see what they know yeah uh, thank you gail um one more here in the q a for you uh, historically conservation has been a word as further displaced Indigenous people from their traditional territories. How do you approach conservation with in mind? The stewards and experts in conservation are, are our Indigenous communities. And so one of the things that we talk about in the science plan is how, I mean, that's why, you know, one of the centers of excellence should be its traditional ecological knowledge. For goodness sakes, we've got thousands of years of knowledge there. The stewards of the lands are our indigenous people and they should be the leads in doing this. And I noticed very recently, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Great Lakes Protection Initiative, which is their funding source, they typically have funds for remediation and so on. They have specifically dedicated funds for indigenous led stewardship programs and you know, bravo to them for doing that. I think it's our indigenous leaders that we need to listen to and learn from. And, and, and learn from them on how we can engage with them on the type of stewardship work that they do in their traditional places. It's a hard thing because each, each, each First Nation is their own nation and they all have their own knowledge and their own approaches. So Western science tries to normalize everything across everything. And, and, and our indigenous people are very diverse in their knowledge and that there's a huge richness there that we need to understand how that dialogue works. And I will say it's very complicated. And you know, one of our commissioners at the International Joint Commission is an indigenous leader. Um, many of you probably recognize the name Henry Lickers. And when Henry and I were talking, it was like, how do we do this? And Henry said, you know, 20 years ago, First Nations and Western scientists didn't even talk at all. And now we're having the conversations and that's the starting point. It's, it's gaining the trust, starting the conversations and, and learning slowly by doing. Yeah, absolutely, Gail, that's a really great point. And there's so much really great work in invasive species management anyways, as far as I know, that's already happening in First Nations. Um, I know we had a presentation for anybody that sat in last year on that forum about some innovative drone work that we're doing in First Nations. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on that we really need to into that knowledge is so important. Okay, I all the questions that I have in the QA. If there's anything remaining, uh, we have put Gail's email address into the chat box for you if you have any standing burning questions for her as we move on through the day. Um, otherwise, I think we can let you guys go a couple minutes early and we have our next session starting at 1.30. So looking forward to seeing you all there. And thank you so much, Gail, for joining us this afternoon and for your great uh, thought provoking talk. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, learning more as this goes on. So thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity. Of course. Thank you. And I'll see everybody.